Hi, I'm Jeremy Allison. I'm here in Tokyo at the Linux Foundation Conference, and I'm here with Rusty Russell from IBM's um, Auslabs kernel development team. So, Rusty, let's start with a simple question. What is it you do in the Linux kernel? Well, Jerry, um, I do three things. Uh, I look after the module subsystem. So the bits of the kernel that can basically be added and removed at runtime. Um, I'm the person who actually looks after the stuff that makes that work. Um, the other thing that I do is look after Elgest. Elgest is a virtualization system. Um, it's designed to be the smallest, simplest, slowest, dumbest virtualization system on the planet, and it achieves that in spades. And the third thing I do is look after all the virtualization, virtual I.O. drivers. Um, these are the drivers used by KVM and also my Elgest project that do network and block and console driving and all that kind of stuff. So I look after that and the standard. Uh, so, okay. so KVM is the kernel virtualization manager, the bit that basically allows guest operating systems to run on top of the native Linux kernel, right? Yes. Um, there are actually several virtualization systems out there, but KVM, the kernel virtual machine, is the one that people find sexiest at the moment. But you've also done a bunch of other things as well. I believe that you're inventor of the wonderfully named uh, Futex system, which is uh, futile mutexes, and uh, <laughs> maybe you could tell us a little bit about that. Wow, okay. Um, that was a long time ago. Um, but yes, I did uh, contribute to Futexes. Um, I wrote the original code uh, and importantly came up with the name Futex. Um, so uh, the complaint was that we didn't have a fast way of two processes under Linux um, locking against each other. There are lots of cases where two processes will want to work together, but they need something protected. And in that case, you need a lock. Um, there are a number of locking systems out there, but they're all pretty slow. So we needed something that was modern and fast. Hence the name Futex is fast mutex, basically. Um, plus, it hadn't been used yet. And not futile, what a shame. And you also you also came up with a, another name for a rather interesting read-write lock system? Yes. Actually, Paul McCarris uh, helped me implement uh, a read-write lock rather than a straight mutex in terms of uh, futexes. And so we called that a fur walk. Which was a sort of a well, like a Futex only company. It's, it's basically one of the fuzzy creatures out of Star Wars that run around with um, you know uh, uh, stone tools and uh, pretty much I think. <laughs> yes. it's, it's yeah. Unfortunately, fortunately, Futex yeah, Futexes have definitely taken off, but Furwalks not so much. Ah. And don't feed them after midnight. <laughs> <laughs> and never <laughs> ever get them wet. That's <laughs> That's all I have to say about that. <laughs> so, um, I believe by the rather strange accent, you're uh, actually not a native Californian like myself, but you are in fact Australian. So, how did you get involved um, from Australia in doing the Linux kernel work? That's that. That is a really good question. Um, Ooh, it actually, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. It actually helps me from the middle of nowhere. Um, I got involved, before I got involved with Linux, um, I was involved with other free software projects like GCC. Um, and the main reason was because there simply weren't enough people around doing really, really interesting work where I was. So having a project where you could contribute and work with people who were insanely brilliant um, was hugely attractive. But being in the middle of nowhere where nobody knew anything about computers made that really difficult. So when the internet came along, it was incredibly attractive, and that's why there are a lot of Australian free software developers, because we were attracted to the idea that you can collaborate with these people who you normally wouldn't get a chance to if you had to see them face to face. So I actually think it was an advantage coming from somewhere where there was nothing to do except write code. What? You, you mean you weren't out there with your core cat slaying kangaroos and stuff like that? Though? Well, sorry. <laughs> that, that was my day job, but <laughs> you know, for my hobby, of course, I uh, yeah, cut code. Ah, yes. So, um, the internet connection to Australia is not actually the best. Um, it's, well, uh, uh, you know, from when I've been there, it's, it's a little slow. Um, are things getting better in that respect, or are you still on the end of a nasty wet piece of string going somewhere? Well, th it is a fundamental limitation at the speed of light, unfortunately. And uh. although continental drift is occurring, it is not fast enough to really meet our needs. So, 
<laughs> to some extent, we're always stuck with this tyranny of distance, and latency will always be high. Um, and when all the interesting stuff in the world is based somewhere in California, you just have to suck it. Um, that's it. But it is certainly, uh, for, for local bandwidth and local bandwidth availability, it's getting better. Um, but you've just fundamentally got this long wire that you're going to have to deal with. Um, this is one of the reasons why when people talk about all these fantastic online cloud blahs, um, it's Adelaide, Australia is the last place it's going to come to. <laughs> Uh, wouldn't that be Melbourne? Is that... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, um, not to knock Australia. Actually, some of the most brilliant free software developers uh, are Australian. I mean, there's Andrew Trigil, there's, uh, some would say, yourself, uh, there's Paul McCarran. Only if they haven't met Trig. <laughs> <laughs> well, possibly so, but what is Andrew it Morton. about... Uh, Andrew Morton, of course, yes, um, uh, my colleague at Google. What is it about the... I don't know, the Australian educational system, there's something about it that actually creates these absolutely brilliant computer scientists. So um, how, how does this happen, do you think? I don't know. I, I don't think... Uh, you know, the obvious fact is you've got a first world country with a high rate of uh, uh, computer ownership fairly early on. <laughs> Again, I think it's part of the tyranny of distance. We never had the critical mass in most places to have a place where you could go and be absorbed by the great minds. Um, we didn't have our Xerox Park or anything like that. So if you were really good at this, you quickly found that you'd outstrip most of your immediate peers in your vicinity. Um, that made you ripe for when we got the, you know, the, the open source revolution really happening, um, to reach out to those groups. And so that's why I think in the open source world, Australia's punched far above their weight because yeah. it was an incredibly attractive um, opportunity for everyone to go, ooh, actually I can deal with people who are even smarter than I am and, and, and really know this stuff without having to actually fly for 12 hours across the ocean to, to find stuff out. But but why, why is it open source? I mean, you've got these absolutely brilliant developers. It, it, um, in many other countries, these brilliant developers ended up doing proprietary software. But in Australia, most of them seem to end up doing free software and open source. And so is there something in the Australian national character, the educational system, you know, um, yeah, uh, you're right, Australia really punches its weight way above its, its weight doing, doing free software. So what is it about free software and open source that made you interested? Well, I think I started, uh, before I got involved with Linux, um, working on GCC, um, because I was using it in my day job, and... Um, particularly G++, the C++ compiler, and there were a couple of things that I really wanted to enhance with warnings and things like that. Um, and once you discovered that pool of people you know, and, and you're dealing with people who were um, amazingly talented programmers, it's really hard to turn around and go back once you've been exposed to a pool of people who are really not only extremely good at what they do, but passionate. Um, then I think that that was incredibly attractive. And I think it's, it's fr fr quite frankly, the lack of alternatives. There just weren't those groups where you could get that kind of feedback other than the open source world, um, the tyranny of distance again. So you actually think it's the fact that you can get kind of instant feedback for stuff that you do, you can collaborate because it's an open collaboration system. You don't have to just collaborate with the people inside your own company. Um, it's this kind of things that actually make it very, very attractive for, for, pe for people in somewhat more isolated nations to, to work on this stuff. Yeah. 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 I mean, certainly these days, I work for a big organisation, but uh, most companies in Australia are quite small, and so your chances of having a, a, a large, top-notch technical team are basically zero. Um, so if you want to get that exposure to, a, to the broader world, open source is the way to do it. So imagine, um, think back to when you're just coming out of college, um, you're looking at the open source world as it is now. What advice would you give to someone who's just starting in their career who might want to get into open source and be the success that, that you are? How would you, how would you suggest they go? Find something you're passionate about. Find something you really want to do. Find a project that excites you. Start one, join one. Don't concentrate on... The, the longer term. Concentrate on the code and the thing that you want to do. Um, get excited about that. The rest will just follow. Um, but unless you have that start, 
there's no point. So don't look for a project. If you want to become famous, find something you love working on and just do it. Don't let the mundane things stop you from doing what you really want to do and enjoy it. If you don't enjoy it, do something else. Pretty good advice. So essentially you're saying start doing something as a hobby and see where it takes you, which I must confess is how I started. Yeah. All right, well, thanks very much, Trusty. Um, thanks a lot for talking to us, and I hope you have a great rest of conference. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.